Okay, so today's feature is going to be on the SKS 45 rifle. As the name would suggest, the SKS was introduced by the Soviet Union in 1945. Uh, it followed the kind of aborted attempt to release the SVT-40 back in 1940 during the Second World War, which if you look through uh, the page history, you'll find that video. The SKS is kind of considered the greatest failure in the history of modern firearms. And by that, I mean it was a failure for its intended purpose, but it actually became quite successful later on. As you'll remember, uh, the Soviet Union released the SVT-40 in 1940. Uh, and that was designed to replace the venerable M9130, which was released in its original iteration back in 1891. So the Soviets were using a bolt-action rifle 40 years after it was originally introduced. And the SVT-40 proved to be more complicated to manufacture, so the Soviets ended up sticking with the M9130 for pretty much the entirety of the Second World War. So, Simonov in 1945, at the behest of the Soviet High Command, designed and introduced the SKS-45. Like the SVT-40, it was a semi-automatic firearm. Unlike the SVT-40, though, it fired what's called an intermediate-level cartridge. The Soviets were kind of ahead of their time. Most military firearms at the time were firing what's called full-power cartridges, essentially ballistically equivalent to a 308 cartridge. Soviets decided to move to this round, the inter an intermediate-level cartridge, 7 by 7.62 by 39 millimeters, made more famous by the AK-47, which we'll discuss in a couple of minutes. As I said, the SKS was a failure because Two years later, uh, Mikhail Kalashnikov put a wrench in Simonov's works and introduced the AK-47. Uh, the Soviets quickly realized that semi-automatic firearm wasn't ideal for the changing military tactics post-World War II. Kalashnikov's rifle uh, had the bonus advantage besides firing this exact same round of being fully automatic. Uh, while a lot of Western countries like the United States, Britain, Canada uh, believe that giving soldiers a fully automatic weapon was tantamount to just wasting ammunition because they would just spray and pray, uh, the Russians kind of realized, particularly based on the tactics that they employed, that uh, a fully automatic weapon was going to be the, the standard going forward. And it wasn't until the 1960s that the Americans agreed and introduced the M16. So you're saying to yourself, well, the SKS, it had essentially a two-year lifespan. Uh, they started manufacturing them in 1945. There are rumors that they were tested in the latter days of the Second World War by Russian soldiers, but I've never seen any credible, credible evidence to that. Um, they manufactured them all the way until about the mid 1960s or 50s. Sorry about that. And then after that, they were essentially put in preservative, stuck in uh, warehouses, and that's where they remained unless the Soviets uh, gave them out to third world allies. Uh, they were never going to give them the best, they always gave them the old stuff. The story would have ended there had it not been for the Chinese. Uh, the Chinese were looking for a new firearm for their military, and they looked at the SKS. They saw that it was reliable, sturdy, there's no question about that, uh, and licensed the firearm from the Soviet Union and created their own SKS called the Type 56. It's essentially the exact same thing. Minor changes was they they put a spike bayonet on it, whereas you see the Russians, and it does have a built-in bayonet, the Russians used a blade bayonet, and it's built in. It's a bit of a pain to put on, but it actually comes with its own bayonet. So the Chinese essentially used these all the way up until the 1970s when they too switched to the AK platform. Uh, but the Chinese weren't the only one to use it, of course. Just like the Russians gave their kind of second-hand firearms 
to other people, the Chinese did the same, and gave a ton of these rifles to the Viet Cong during the Vietnam War against the United States. Uh, the NVA continued to uh, use the AK-47 because they were uh, a better trained army, uh, but the Viet Cong used this. And that was great for the enemies, or allies, depending on who's watching this, of the United States because they both use the exact same round. So supplying the NVA and the Viet Cong was pretty simple. Uh, the same ammo drops could be made and both of them could use the exact same round. And there are, are more than a few Vietnam Vietnamese SKSs and they're stamped with Vietnamese uh, logos. Uh, who were, which were brought back to the United States after the Vietnam War. Well, there aren't that many, but there's a few. You can buy them if you want. They cost a hell of a lot of money, though. Again, you'd be thinking, the story must end there. But, like all great rifles, they live well past uh, the days they're considered obsolete. A metric ton of these, like I said, were put into storage by the Soviet Union. And those storage depots were located all across what was the Soviet Empire at the time, including the Ukraine. And if you look at pictures of the current ongoing conflict between the Ukraine government and the pro-Russian rebels, not the Soviet, Russian army, of course, wink, uh, you will see SKS 45s being used by both sides, uh, both pro-Ukrainian nationalists and by... Uh, pro-Russian rebels. So a rifle which was originally introduced in 1945, and you can do the math, it's 2015, is continuing to be used today by uh, armies. You can also find them in the Middle East. Uh, Iraq certainly had a lot of these, and I'm pretty sure that both uh, ISIS and Sunni and Shia tribesmen are both using this rifle. You can find them in Syria as well as World War II rifles like the STG-44 are still being used. Um, they are in use today uh, across the world, uh, in Africa, the Middle East, Europe. And they also happen to be one of the most popular rifles for Canadians. Uh, the reason being is, uh, unlike the United States, which has a ban currently on place, uh, for certain types of Russian firearms. These are easily importable into Canada. And there are so many made and import exported. I believe there was 15 million of these made by the Soviet Union themselves, not including all their allies, that you can pretty much still find these rifles for about 170 to $300, depending on uh, the rarity of the firearm, who it was made by, which factory, what year, all sorts of variables. Collectors are more in tune with that stuff than I am. And that's essentially it. That's the short and convoluted history of the SKS-45. Uh, mine in particular, just to give you some information, was made in 1956, I believe, at the Tula factory. So this one's a, uh, one of the latter stage SKSs. Hope you enjoyed it.